Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Lance I'm alcoholic. Yes. Um, thank you, Brian. You're very nice. Shockingly nice, actually. I was somewhat regretted that after I asked you, but it is what it is. Uh, worked out all right. So uh, I have a sobriety date. It's uh, April the 7th of 2010. I've got a home group. It's called the Bush League Pinch Hitters Group. Uh, we meet on Monday nights in Athens, Georgia. Uh, it starts at 8 o'clock. We open the doors at 7 with coffee served for anybody who's in Athens who would like to participate. It's a great meeting. We grab food afterwards, so don't eat beforehand. Uh, the location varies. That's a good spot. We have a good time with it. So uh, thank you, Jerry, for asking me to come participate. It, it's always an honor and a privilege to be able to do that. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, just a little bit nervous, but it's all right. We'll get through this one. Uh, I started uh, drinking early on. Uh, before that, I didn't have much experience with alcohol. Uh, I've got a, a brother who provided that first experience with alcohol. When I was very young, I remember um, growing up, like, life was pretty good, but I do remember he started enjoying some of the alcoholic beverages uh, at a young age himself. <laughs> and I was, I'm like nine years younger than him, so I was much younger at the time. And uh, I watched some of that, some of his actions kind of start to split apart our family a little bit, kind of tear it up a little bit, and create some turmoil at home and our picturesque family started to look not show not so picturesque from the outside uh i remember one night in particular i was probably i don't know nine or ten years old uh that my parents were downstairs and travis hadn't come home yet that night and it was pretty late and all of a sudden he comes flying into the driveway uh after doing what he did and uh, next thing I know is that, uh, the doors are all open and shutting and everything downstairs, a lot of slamming going on and some yelling going on. Uh, Travis has had another one of his little experiences. And so I heard the front door slam in my room in my house is actually on the front of the house. Right. So I look outside and want to see what's going on in the front yard. And, uh, my dad standing there kind of face to face with my brother and my dad's a big dude. You don't necessarily do that. He's a former boxer. And my brother is not a big dude. He's small. Uh, and my mom's a good al on. She's out there kind of refereeing it back and forth. <laughs> and it's like a scene out of a movie. A car pulls up. Uh, my brother gets in the car. And the car, like, I don't know. That might be embellishing. It drove off uh, <laughs> and, and went up the drive. And I'm standing there watching all this from my window. And I watch my parents, like, slowly walk back inside. And the door shut. And I remember thinking right then, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to split the family up the way that what he's done uh, has done. I'm not, I'm not going to do that stuff. And so I made a commitment to myself that night. I said, I'm not going to drink. No drugs. And uh, I don't know why I threw this in there, but uh, no tobacco either. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of one of those things that I was honestly, even at 9 or 10 years old, after watching the destruction of our family, I was pretty freaking serious about it. Alcohol did not seem like it was something that was worth the destruction of my family. Uh, so we were serious about that and we we're going to move forward, uh, not drinking or anything else. It's in an Al-Anon talk. So, uh, that's not think it is. And, uh, so I did start drinking, obviously, uh, a few years down the line. I remember I was going through, you know, I, and I'll say this, and this is something that you hear oftentimes in, in, in people's stories. I've always felt disconnected. I've always felt some type of distance between you and me. And honestly, it didn't matter if you were my age or older, or younger, whatever. There was always some type of distance. There was always something that disconnected us. I was either better than or less than. And most of the time, honestly, I was less than. And so I walked through life like that. And even with friends, I remember having like friends that I would call and like, hey, let's hang out and play Mario Kart or something and, and have them come over. I always still felt like even though like we would hang out and do stuff together, I was never like friends with them. There was always something that just separated us, and I, and I didn't know what that was. Uh, I've heard people talk about having some type of password to life, like everybody else got it, and I was one digit off at all times. And I felt like that. That's the way my insides felt being around anybody. Uh, I went through uh, elementary school, middle school, no drinks. Uh, 
I went through uh, middle school and I gotten pretty decent on the football field. Uh, a little bit better every time I tell the story, but uh, it was one. <laughs> I, it was one of those things that honestly I started to like feel good out there, and athletics was kind of an escape from what was going on at the house at times. Um, and so, <laughs> I, I remember going out and you know playing football and sports and everything. And then I started to do something. I've always had this thing where I've always wanted to be like known. Uh, that probably hasn't ended in sobriety, but I've always wanted to be somewhat known. And, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I remember walking into sixth grade year at, at Crabapple Middle School and like two months into the, the school year, they had this like newscast thing that they showed throughout the middle school and everybody, you like, you, you know, they said their name on the newscast. So I was like, everybody's going to get to know me if I join this thing. So I joined the newscast, Crabapple Middle School. And uh, and I walked in there for like our first little meeting, right? And they said, well, what would you like to do? One of the open positions they had was the weatherman. And you know how cool it is to be a high school weather or middle school weatherman? <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. It's really cool. Uh, so anyways, I, uh, I said, I'll do that, right? And so we would go through this thing where they would film the, the weatherman, st- or they would film the whole newscast. It wasn't just the weatherman. But they would film the, the newscast on like, a Thursday, right, or Wednesday or Thursday, and they would actually show it the following Monday. I don't know if anybody pays close attention to weather, but (laughs) forecasts five days out are never right, ever. And so, like, I would, they would film it on Thursday, and then it would show on Monday, and I would be, like, in front of this, just a map. It wasn't, like, you know, in a cool graphics or anything. But I'd be like, it's going to rain today, and it'd be, like, sunny. (laughs) And it was not good. It's not a good look. Uh... And so I literally, I remember the first time that it aired or whatever, uh, I think my forecast was pretty close. And so I remember walking out of like my classroom in there and thinking that like everybody knows me now. And they didn't. Well, they did, but they didn't. It, I was ridiculed at times. Uh, evidently, it is not as cool as I thought it would be to be the middle school weatherman. And so it's kind of one of those things that like I would, you know, I, and, and you don't quit something that you start. That's what I've been taught. Uh, not that's what I've been taught. That's what was forced, <laughs> and that's what we did. And so I started doing that, and 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 I started then skipping school on Mondays or getting sick. I I actually I was very sick on Mondays more often than not. Um, I uh, I would go into school and be like, oh God, here we go again. Uh, and thankfully that school year ended. Uh, but the reality is, is that that next fall, like I thought that okay, I'm not going to do that this time, and I'm just going to you know, be a regular student, whatever. And so I would, it, it still continued on. And I remember this is one of the things, this didn't make me not hot, but I, I wanted to drink. And so I went through this thing where I was like, I would go in, I would do that, that stuff when I was in, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade, it followed me in there. I was good on the football field. I was good on the baseball field. All these guys that were like, you know, we were celebrating like big wins and all this stuff, right? Seventh grade football. And so like, we had a good time. Like they were my best friends out there because I could block and tackle. Uh, and then I walk into school the next day and it was like, don't be near that guy. Right. There at least, I'm sorry. That's not really what's happening. That was going on in my head. <laughs> like there was definitely, I look back on it and I think about some of the, the events that took place and I don't know about y'all, but man, I can blow some things up pretty quick. Even it's, you know, sixth and seventh grade. Well, I still haven't had a drink yet. Eighth grade rolls around and some of the upperclassmen who had still been giving me that hard time throughout those middle school years, they went on to high school, so I thought, here we go. This is my year, right? They're all gone. I'm going to fit in now. I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be, you know, all this stuff. And that just, once again, still wasn't the case. But I got a call one day, and they said, would you like to come hang out? And they was like the cool people in my grade. And so I remember when I got that call, I was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go over there, and I'm going to join the cool crowd. If I'm around them, boom, we're looking good, right? And I remember I walked in there, I went over there to Matt's house and we went down to Matt's basement because that's what cool kids do. Went down there and we hung out and we were on like the couches, I don't know, playing Xbox or something. And one of them said, hey, do y'all want a drink tonight? And I said, of course I do. Now, I had been faking that I had drunk before that, but, you know, that's, I had to fit in right then. I couldn't say, no, I wasn't going to drink because then, uh, then uh, it would be obvious too I hadn't, that I hadn't drank like I had kind of faked that I had. Uh, and so... Matt went upstairs and got these two terrible little water bottles of very, very bad vodka. 
Uh, it tasted like hairspray. I remember that. And it was kind of one of those things that like, you know, when, when he brought him back down and we were hanging out there, I briefly actually thought about that night that I had made that promise. I wasn't going to drink. I wasn't going to do drugs. I wasn't going to do that stuff. And that thought went out of my head quickly because all that I knew was is that if I don't participate, I'm not going to fit in, and I've just missed my one audition to be a cool kid in school. And so nobody was like, hey, man, drink this, right? It was just like, do you want to come join us? And it was like, yes, <laughs> desperately. <laughs> Anything to get outside of right here right now. And that's, you know, I went down there, and we, we kind of hung out, and they're passing around the vodka, and it comes around to me, and I take a swig of this very, very bad vodka. They had some orange juice to chase it with, thank God. So I took a big swig of the orange juice and went around a second time. I took a swig of that of the vodka. I took a bigger swig of the orange juice. And I remember, you know, it's just a bad experience. Uh, this is terrible. I didn't know who I was hanging out with. This stuff's awful, right? And I took another swig and it went around about a third or fourth time. And all of a sudden, something happened. Something happened that all, like, those guys then became my best friends. We were going to call some girls. We were going to have a party. It's going to be a good time. All this stuff that, like, you know, I had never felt before. I'd never fit in this way, ever, ever. And, but now all of a sudden I'm fitting in. And it's like I have found the key to this and this being my life, right? I finally got some people that I can hang out with. It only took alcohol to make that happen. Uh, but that night was great. I had a fantastic night, uh, fantastic night that night. I had no issues. Uh, the next morning I woke up. I don't even think I was hung over. It was fantastic. Like, this is something we need to do a lot. And so the next weekend uh, rolls around. And, you know, I, I remember talking to Sam and, and asking him, hey, man, where are we drinking this weekend? Right? He's like, I don't think we have anything to drink. <laughs> well, we need to get something. Like, I, <laughs> this was like the key to my life. I finally found it. And so, anyways... Uh, I drank every opportunity that I did that I could when I was in high school. Uh, high school was great. Never really had any big issues in high school with the drinking aspect of it. Uh, from the outside looking in, it looked like things were pretty good. I will say the inside, I'm starting to get some issues with, like, my friends. I'm starting to do things I regret. I'm starting to wake up with some of those, like, uh-oh, what happened last night? And then you take a look at the text messages, and it's just not good. I remember looking at, at my phone and thinking, oh, God, I called my football coach. I did that multiple times. I still don't. Anyways, so... <laughs> I would. That was one of my like fan favorite things to do. I was assigned a alter ego name. Uh, it was called Dot Lip Rev. Apparently, late one night when I was up at uh, Sugar Mountain, North Carolina, with some buddies, I was hammered. And I walked out. I had had some tobacco in my lip, and apparently, it was all over my lip. And I don't know. Apparently, I get preachy sometimes when I get drunk. And so, Dot Lip Rev became my alter ego. My buddies would be like, "Hey, man, is the Rev coming in town tonight?" And I'm like, "You know he is, baby. We're, this is what we're doing." And so, uh, I don't know, that's kind of, you know, high school was fun. That's just what we did. Uh, college started out fun, uh, and then it didn't. Um, one of my good buddies, Justin, he had actually, one of the guys that I drink with a whole lot, uh, he, had, uh, he had gone to rehab for some reason. And so, like, his parents thought it was a good idea. And so they brought him over to rehab, and he went to Mar. If anybody's been familiar with Mar, there's a few folks not. Uh, so, pretty good spot over there they're good people and uh so he will goes over to mars doing like their little treatment program whatever and i remember it was over thanksgiving it may have been christmas break i think it was over thanksgiving uh 2007 uh he gets like a little day pass or whatever and so they he he, he comes over to hang out at my house with his parents came over too so like all of us his parents were type my parents that kind of stuff right and so we all hung out over there and, and justin said hey can i uh, go get some cigarettes from the gas station real quick. So Justin and I took off, went to the gas station to go get some cigarettes. And on the way over there, we're talking. And, you know, I was an expert on AA, by the way, because my brother had gone to AA, and he had gotten sober at this point. And so I knew what alcoholism was, uh, at least in my own head, right? So we're, we're riding over there, and he's like, man, I, I don't know that I'm actually an alcoholic. And I was like, dude, you're not. You drink like I do. It's all good. No worries. <laughs> and so uh, I told him, I was like, man, just play it cool. Just don't, you know, just get through the next 90 days, whatever, how long they're going to keep you there. And then get back out. You'll be fine. It's not a big deal. Just if you try to leave, they're going to think you're an alcoholic. So don't do that. And so, uh, you know, I'm giving him some, like, good words of advice or whatever, right? And he goes back to Mar, and I go back. I actually started out school at Valdosta State, 
university. <laughs> I don't know if I was ever drinking Remerton, but that's a fun experience. Um, but we use, you know, it's kind of one of those things. I was down there, and, and you know, that's where the alcohol started to, you know, my drinking started to escalate. Uh, they had this place called, I don't remember the name of it, but they had this place that had Wednesday nights, had a special, it was called Sink or Swim Nights, 10 bucks. And you got to drink all you wanted. And it was, you either sank or you swam. <laughs> and I, I sank fairly often. I remember there was one night, apparently it was raining, so I was running home, hammered, and I ran straight into a lake, just straight <laughs> into it, like a cartoon character or something would. Um, I didn't realize that, though. I remember when I got home, my, one of my roommates was like, dude, what, the, what happened to you? And the next day, as we were driving by, I was like, oh, God, there's a lake there. <laughs> it's, it is what it, you know. It was dark. Um, and so, but, you know, that's kind of not really a bad thing, but, you know, there's some stuff that's going on that, like, I'm starting to back people off from me. They're starting to, like, go, whoa, what's going on with that guy? Like, dude, you really shouldn't get that drunk. I remember I had an RA one time. It's like, you know, I really should have, like, reported you, but you were obviously having a rough night last night, so I didn't do that. I was like, well, thanks, man. Uh, but I was, you know, it was starting to spiral a little bit out of control. I was out of all money at all times. Uh, that's why the $10 sink or swim night was night. But, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things that, you know, I'm just doing what every 19-year-old does in college. It's just what we do. This is, just, this is not abnormal. Nothing about my drinking was abnormal, at least in my own head at the time. Um, there was plenty of reasons for me to kind of <coughs> demount from the uh, drinking scene and stop drinking. Uh, but I didn't like normal drinkers would have some of these problems come up in their lives. Their friends, good friends from all those years start to back off and start to let, want to hang out with you less and less. Right. Uh, and, and like, I couldn't see any of that. I just continued blazing my path. And, uh, I remember there's one day in particular, I just come back, went home for Christmas break, came back and it was about, you know, first week or so of January that, uh, I remember I'd walked out of class and gone over to, uh, I was still going at that point. Uh, and I walked over to class and went over to Sam's place, same Sam from over here. And uh, we start drinking because it's the afternoon. And so we're drinking. And I remember I was two beers in. And I had like six phone calls from my brothers, like three or four phone calls from my mom, three or four phone calls from my dad. And then all of a sudden my mom calls back to back to back, right? Which even in our family is abnormal. Uh, and so I found on the third one, I was like, something's going on. So I'm going to step outside. I went outside to Sam Storm and answered the phone. I don't know why, but I went outside and, uh, and I said, what's going on? And she, and my mom said, look, I just wanted you to know, cause I'm about to walk on your campus about 10 minutes out right now. And I don't want you to freak out when you see me. Uh, but Justin overdosed and died last night. And, uh, I'm about to pick you up. We're going down to his parents' house. And the first thing that went through my head was, what I had told him, right? Like what the fact that I had told him, say, hey, man, you're not an alcoholic. Don't worry about it. Just get out of rehab. Go on from there. You'll be all right, right? Uh, I had pretty much given him the okay to drink again. And in my mind, automatically went from that to I caused him to die. And that was it. That it was my fault. Went down there, Justin's girlfriend standing on the front porch with his mom, with Justin's mom whenever I walk up. And the two of them asked me to deliver the eulogy at Justin's service. And so the next, like, four days, I'm freaking out, trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to write and say at the guy's funeral, who I pretty much said to do what you do, and then everything's going to be all right, and he passed away. And I remember still giving that eulogy, thinking to myself, how can you do this right now? It's just the way my head was fixed at the time. Thankfully, there's steps and amends later on down the line that, you know, cleared some of that stuff up for me. But at the time, that's all I was equipped with, was just that I had caused this, and it is what it is. And so... I get through, uh, I go through that. I come back up there to, to about Austin State, and I went through I went through a freaking bender. I just went for like three or four weeks there straight up. I think every single night I was just hammered, not just drunk, not just drinking. I was hammered. And I couldn't, I didn't put two and two together, right? I mean, I couldn't. And so um, I figured out that I needed to get sober. I transferred to, I figured out. I was helped with that. There was some suggestions along the way, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, I ended up going to, I transferred schools because that's how you get sober. And so I went to, I transferred to Perimeter College locally here, lived with my parents. That didn't work. I transferred back down to Valdosta State. Uh, and honestly, that went okay when I went back for like three weeks. And so we were okay. And then all of a sudden, boom, guess what? The same stuff that shows up in my life over and over and over again 
shows back up, right? I remember looking in the mirror thinking, how did this happen again? So I said, all right, we got we to sober up again. So I decided I was going to transfer schools again because I've got to get away from all these old friends, get around some new people. We're good to go, right? So I decided for me to sober up, I would transfer to UGA in Athens. And so that's what I did. And I transferred up there. I walked into, I lived with these three guys. I have no idea who they were. All three of them could be in here tonight. I would have no idea. And it was kind of one of those things. I had this thing about like taking out the trash. I don't know. I just wouldn't do anything with these guys. And I was just kind of there. Uh, but for 90 days, I didn't drink a drop of alcohol. Wasn't very happy. Life was not very good during those 90 days, but we made it. And then I ran into her on campus and her asked me if I would like to go downtown that night. And so of course, yes. And I remember I went downtown, I drank a Michelob Ultra that night. I never drank a Michelob Ultra in my life, but I've seen my dad drink Michelob Ultras. He drinks two on a Super Bowl, and that's it. That's all he drinks. You don't get drunk. So Michelob Ultra it is. And then we went from there to the fun stuff because Michelob Ultra is not fun. And so uh, it is what I remember waking up that next morning thinking, oh, my God, how did this happen again? Because some stuff happened that night. And, you know, for the next two or three years, it was really just a whole bunch of stories about not trying to end up in where I was, trying to get something changed about my life. Uh, I was going to class on occasion. Uh, Grades were okay on occasion. Uh, but I was doing a lot of damage. Uh, I joined a fraternity during that time. I don't, uh, I needed friends at some point, I guess. And so, you know, I, I tried that. I remember one time I, I, when I was trying to stop drinking again after joining the fraternity, uh, I coached football in Athens because, you know, one of the things that you can't do is you can't drink and coach children at the same time. It's not allowed, right? So uh, that worked up until about a bye week, and then it, you know, fell, a week, uh, fell apart. Uh, I remember there was one night that, uh, you know, things just went south. <laughs> I, I, apparently, I was helped out of a bar uh, at, called Buddha Bar and uh, helped into a wrought iron railing in front of Buddha Bar with my nose leading the way. And that next day, I'm walking up to practice, and I've got, like, all the coaches there standing there, and, that, like, my whole face is black and blue. And I'm trying to cover this up somehow. And I walk up, and uh, the coaches just, like, kind of opened up. They just kind of looked at me like, what, the heck? what happened to you last night? And so I told them the truth. Uh, I told them that um, as I was helping a buddy move, a desk fell on my face. Because <laughs> <laughs> those are the types of things that I'm equipped to get by with, right? The little tiny stupid stories that they're almost so unimaginable that they're real in somebody else's mind. And I've heard it said in AA, it's not a lie and if they believe you. And I believe that, <laughs> or believed that. Uh, and so it's kind of one of those things that uh, over the next few months down there, or up there, over there, uh, I tried to stop drinking a number of times. I tried to, I, I went to Granada, Nicaragua one time to try to stop drinking. It's another story we don't have time for, but uh, my life was pretty freaking rough. I remember waking up thinking what happened last night, uh, that gift of desperation. I think I had it a few times, but I didn't act on it. Uh, I went to AA meetings up there and because, you know, my brother was involved in AA at the time and his life had completely changed. And so I would go to these meetings. I was sitting in the back of the room and I wouldn't talk to anybody. I'd walk in at 7:58 and I'd walk out at 902. That was my AA membership. I'm getting sober, baby. That's it. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and I didn't get sober, and I wonder why AA doesn't work for me, uh, because I never really did anything. Uh, but I went in and out, in and out, in and out. I mean, I can't tell you how many white chips I picked up, because I honestly, I don't know. I do know that remember I walked into AA this time, I had like six different sobriety dates I knew off the top of my head. Uh, but, I, I, you know, it is what it is. There's a lot more than that. Uh, I saw counselors, therapists, stuff like that. You know, I just lied to all them, so that, that didn't work either. But, you know, it's kind of one of those things that, like, um, I was starting to get some suicidal stuff coming into my head. Uh, I remember, I mean, starting to, I mean, it was quite often. I remember waking up thinking, man, I just got to end all this. This is bad. I'm hurting everybody. Um, I had an attorney's fee I had to pay off, and it was 125 bucks. Uh, and I told my mom it was $750. Uh, they had to pay that attorney uh, for some stuff. And... I told her that the day she got laid off from work and diagnosed with cancer. And so, like, I'm starting to, that look in the mirror is starting to get pretty rough. Uh, my cousin, uh, who had fought in Iraq, uh, was killed in Fallujah. 
and I skipped the services to have a party at my parents' house. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that I did that I'm starting really, I'm racking up that list of just like, this is the human being you are and you ain't worth it. And everybody that I touch ends up hurt some way, somehow, right? Like I'm very good at engaging people and being with them, but in the end, it falls apart and people get hurt. That's just the story of my life. That's the look that I have every time I look in that mirror and I'm hating my life. Suicide was an open option. I remember I'd walk into a bank and just hope somebody would try to rob the bank so I could walk in front of a bullet. I mean, these are active thoughts that would go through my head on a regular basis. It's not happy, joyous, and free. It's kind of one of those things that, you know, most problem drinkers would say, my life is not going well. I need to stop drinking. And they can act upon that decision, stop drinking, and then they, you know, do better. They, they're just better citizens. I'm not that guy. You know, I keep going through all this stuff, and I wonder why it is that I can't stop drinking. And it got to the point, the book talks about it, that life with alcohol and without it just doesn't seem like it's a good fit, right? And I felt like that. But I knew AA didn't work for me. But one night, uh, it was April the 3rd of 2010, uh, I got an email from one of my football players. And, and in my, when I coached, I mean, I coached like a little eighth grade team, right? They're like 13 years old. And uh, this little dude sends me an email, and he says, Coach, I don't know why, but I felt called to pray for you tonight. And I remember thinking, as I was sitting at my paternity house in the room that I had moved into, because my house was, the power and water was cut off. Uh, I had moved in over there. I'm sitting at that desk, and I'm writing back to him saying, Hey, thanks, man. Looking forward to coaching again in the fall. Just some BS answer. And so went through that routine. You know, but I remember thinking to myself, oh, my God. The kid has no idea how right he is. I wonder, you know, that's kind of weird that he does. He, he was spot on with me. My life was a freaking disaster. And uh, two days later, uh, I've got to take a midterm or find, I don't know which one. I know it was a big test for my real estate 4000 course. I'm still not sure why I was in that course, but I was. And so I went in there to go take, or I'm sorry, I did not go in there to go take. I went into the my room to go study the night before because I hadn't been to class yet that semester. And so we were going to open up the book and get to reading. One of my room, or one of my fraternity brothers, Blake, used to drink and study at the same time, and he used to talk about how that always. And so I, I, I let's try that. Well, one of my fraternity brothers walked upstairs. He said, "Hey, we've also we got some girls that are coming over tonight. They were underage, so they needed to help some help purchasing some alcohol." So I said, "I'll go purchase the alcohol for y'all, and I'll buy something else for me on the side." And I literally remember taking like two drinks that night, and I woke up. If any of y'all have had that before, it's like a little time machine where it's just like, all right, this is number two, and then boom, it's just boom, right? And so it's kind of, you know, I remember I woke up, I had failed out of UGA. I, I woke up, well, before that, I woke up, I emailed the professor, and again, I got honest with him. I told him I was in the hospital, and that's why I wasn't at the, the final, which I was supposed to be at. And he was like sitting at his desk, at his email, and he immediately emailed me back and was like, hey, man, hope you're okay. I need a timestamp note of when you arrive at the hospital, though. And we'll get you taken care of. You can retake the final. So who says a timestamp note? I mean, just like, what kind of professor is this guy? <laughs> and so I went through, uh, like, I got up and I was like, this is just it, man. I'm just done. I, I freaking, and I've had many of these moments before, but I'm just, I'm done. I can't live like this anymore. I can't stop drinking. I can't keep drinking. I have nowhere to go. And so uh, I, I said, I'm going to go kill myself. And so I, got, I dropped in my truck. I was going to go drive my truck and kill myself via my truck. And so uh, on my way to that site, I remember I, I was driving over there, and uh, the thought of that kid sending me that email like two days prior popped into my head. And I thought about, I was like, my God, that was like perfect timing. And I can't believe he thought about that. And then I, I thought about, you know, how he would be at my funeral service and how some others would be at funeral service. So then I realized, you know, suicide's kind of a one-and-done thing. You only get one shot at that. So I decided to go see a counselor at UGA real quickly just to run this idea by them. And, uh, <laughs> and then we would go, I could still go kill myself. That's still a, a viable option, right? And so uh, I, I go ahead and see the counselor. I didn't, um, <laughs> anyways, I, I saw the counselor and then I went home after that. Uh, I, I went to Ridgeview and they did an assessment. They didn't have anywhere to put me in Ridgeview. Uh, so I stayed at my parents' house for a couple more days. And I remember my mom coming in there and she was like, she, she, I don't know about you. I have this thing about my alcoholism that like, I'm an alcoholic up until I'm about three days after the last drink. 
and then I'm no longer an alcoholic. And that was a major exaggeration. And I should have never freaking told anybody because that was now everybody's got all this blown up idea about my alcoholism that doesn't exist that I exaggerated with three days ago. I don't know if anybody else. But so I remember, you know, I'm on day three and I've like reconnected with some of the bad idea. And so like I remember trying to convince my parents I had straight A's in Athens. And if I could, I hadn't been to class yet, but I had straight A's in Athens. And if I, I should go back up there and then I will do treatment after Athens, after that semester. And uh, I remember my dad saying, well, this is the worst lie ever. If this is actually true or if this is actually, I mean, it, it, there's no way that you're lying this badly. It's just not even a good lie. And so they were considering the fact that I should go back up there. Thankfully, somebody, they reached out to somebody and got some good Allen on support for that. But uh, my mom walked into my room one day, and she was like, hey, you need to go to the hospital. I said, why is that? And they said, well, because of the amount of alcohol that you told the, the counselor at Ridgeview uh, that they, uh, they think you have significant liver damage, and you need to go get that checked right now. And so uh, I, was, I remember thinking to myself, I was like, if I tell her, no, I'm not going, she's going to think I'm an alcoholic. So I was like, all right, I'll go. And I said, well, which hospital are we going to? She said, Ridgeview. And then I knew it was Dover. I was just like, oh, my God. you got to be kidding me. I walked into Ridgeview, and there's this little guy named Jeter. Some of you guys may know. Uh, and this little guy named Jeter is in there. He's getting kicked out of this, this little like, group session that they've got going on. He's got this, like, flat bill red hat. He's got this red shirt and red shorts and red shoes. And I remember looking at him thinking, my God, what if I just walked into? This is the wrong spot. This guy, he's getting kicked out of a meeting. The people are yelling at him and all this stuff. I'm like, I'm in the wrong place. I was in a fraternity in Athens. I was brother of the year last year. I should not be here, right? And so, you know, I remember standing there and looking. I looked over at my mom. My mom was like, you're not going anywhere, so don't even ask. And I went in there. And I remember that first night looking up the ceiling and thinking, my God, at least I can't hurt anybody right now, which that was a big deal for me right then. Um, and I felt like I was in a much safer environment there than I had been in a long time. And for the next 28 days or so, people would come into, come into Ridgeview, carry meetings in there, and they would talk about the disease of alcoholism. And I would start to relate to these things that I shouldn't relate to in these rooms. And I had done that before, but not to the extent this time. Something about what the message was, I don't know. I think, honestly, it was the first time I was actually able to hear it. That I wasn't just sitting in the back of the room thinking why I wasn't an, why I wasn't an alcoholic. That I was actually sitting there in something that gets a desperation again. But this one was real. And this one was the fact that I could hear and then it was no longer why am I different. It's that, my God, parts of me are the same. I knew that the guys I was in treatment with there, they were all alcoholics. There's no doubt in my mind. I was still clinging to the idea that perhaps I wasn't. Come to find out, they were all thinking the same thing about me. It's just, <laughs> it is what it is. That's kind of the way that rolls over there. But uh, we developed a pretty good friendship in there. I remember there was one guy in particular, Carter, uh, who had my freaking story, like word by word, same story, same family background, same family, all this stuff, right? He had the same life growing up. And this guy was so fired up about Alcoholics Anonymous and so fired up about changing his life around. And he was like one of those guys just in your face, like your life is about to, right? And, and I was happy about that for him. Uh, <laughs> and, it, you know, I remember uh, we were in a Tuesday night. They had this little group like thing going on there on Tuesday nights. And Carter stands up and he says that I saw my dope man today. And at the, I don't know, gas station or something, I don't know. And, uh, and the guy walked up to him apparently and was like, hey, do you want some stuff? And he's like, no, don't want it. My life has changed. We're good. And the entire room gave him like a standing ovation. And then that next Tuesday, that same very meeting, we're in there mourning his death. And I remember thinking, this is the guy that I related to the most. He had just graduated that Friday before. And I remember his two brothers standing right there talking about how close they were and how good their life was now that he's getting sober and he's changing all this stuff. I remember sitting there thinking like, man, that was just like mom, except he's dead now. And we went to his funeral service and I'm happy they took us there because I got to see what it, was look, what it looked like from the other side of this stuff. That whole part where I think that I'm just hurting myself. Nah, man, it's not true. <laughs> it's not true at all. And watching all of that take place and thinking, that is my life. That is exactly where I'm headed. I'm going to end up, and I say all that because, honestly, there was, we got very serious in there at that point. Our group, our little group of guys got very serious. There's still like six guys that are still sober from uh, that group of guys that were in around that same time seven years later. And that was a big deal uh, to kind of see that this is what happens to us, right? 
And so I, know, I got out of Richview, went on to Hope Homes, and some of those guys I did not want to be friends with, but my God, thank God I was. And there was a guy there named Trevor who was late to moving into Hope Homes one night, and he was running around clueless. <laughs> he was like, I'm not going to be able to do 90 and 90 if I don't get a meeting right now, right? <laughs> and so this guy pulls into the parking lot, and this great member of Alcoholics, named, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous named Phil, who had just put in like a 14-hour day, pulls in the parking lot, sees Trevor running around outside of this building, and he goes over and he said, what's going on, man? He said, I got to get to a meeting. It's 14 hours into the day, right? It's plenty of time for him to go and go home and say, Trevor, call somebody else. Go do what you got to go do. Figure out how to get there. Take Marta. I don't know. Right? Just get to a meeting somehow. Uh, Phil put in the effort. He put in the time. He picked Trevor up. He brought Trevor to that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would not know Frick. I would not know Franny or anybody else that's important in my life. Honestly, today, had that little connection not happened, God, had, God does these little tiny things throughout our stories and throughout my story to actually give me a chance at sobriety that in the moment it feels like it's just a coincidence that a guy was late getting out of Ridgeview and he's spinning around out there. Right? Not coincidence. My higher power today lined that bad boy up perfectly. And Phil went through the effort. He said, I'm going to go pick up this guy. He brought him to a meeting. Uh, it's called Fifth Tradition Group. It's a fantastic meeting. He meets on Saturday nights. He brought him over there to the Fifth Tradition Group. I think it was on Thursday night that they brought him over there. But he introduced him to this guy named Nelson and these other guys. And, this other, and Nelson would later become my sponsor, who has saved my tail so many freaking times. And this program, through, through going through this stuff, seeing these little tiny like bits and pieces come together, my life is a heck of a lot better than it was when I first walked through here. When I walked through over there at Ridgeview, they heard my story, because that's like the thing you do on day three, is you tell your story. And they said, Lance, you better get rid of all your old friends. What I heard was, Lance, you got no more friends. <laughs> right? Like, it's all done. Welcome to AA. Woo. Right? And so, thankfully, that's not what happened got the best friends I've ever had as a result of being in this program. And so, um, you know, I, there's so many different small things. But I'd say the, the, the program in and of itself, the 12 steps, I was absolutely terrified. I figured that if I could, like, fake one, two, and three, and four was kind of like, uh-oh, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to do step four. Uh, there's a lot in my past I'm not proud of. You know, I mean, the stuff with my mom, the stuff with this, those are the little tiny things that I feel okay about sharing in front of everybody here. There's a lot of stuff in there that I'm absolutely not proud of, period. And I am terrified of those things getting out and my past catching up. And now you're telling me I've got to write that stuff down and I got to go share that with some dude who's like <laughs> not a professional. <laughs> <laughs> and this is going to help me not drink alcohol one day. It doesn't make sense. But I saw, I saw Carter and that casket. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. So sat there with Buster. And we went over that fourth step in a fifth step setting. We discussed it. And I walked out of there after having been nervous and terrified for a month or two before that. And I walked out of there just like on top of the world. Like some weight had been lifted off my shoulder. I had no idea I was still carrying. The, the, this program freaking works if you work it. It really, really does. Uh, I had no thought that that was actually going to work, that if I actually shared about those three or four things I had no intention on sharing on, that I would feel some type of relief. And then there's some other steps come after that, six and seven. I don't think I really worked those honestly when I first went through them. That's something that's a much bigger part of my life today in the years following than it was when I first went through them. Because honestly, when I got to six and seven, I was terrified again. <laughs> Step eight. But I had that experience on five that I knew something was actually working around here. So we did step eight. We did step nine. It took me years to make my amends, especially my financial amends. And it is what it is. Uh, you know, it's just I don't think I'd still be. Matter of fact, no, I wouldn't still be here today if I hadn't made those amends. And there were some amends on there I was absolutely terrified of making and did not want to make them. And those became the biggest. Some of the most of the time people were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, that happens. Oh, OK. All right. Uh, no, we're good. And that's, you know. Some of the gifts. What I've learned through that step nine was something that I've, I've learned about my higher power. And that's the fact that the grace of people in this world today is 10,000% higher than I thought it was. I thought they'd hang that stuff over me, that I would talk to them about this stuff. They would throw it right back at me and that I would then you know, die. <laughs> and it didn't happen. Way more often than not, the unexpected occurs. And I 
suddenly years of feuding, years of resentment get washed away in a moment. A few of those guys were able to reach out and get some help for some stuff they were going through. And, you know, it's a pretty cool deal. 10, 11, and 12, it's just kind of one of those things that, you know, those are like six and seven, honestly, bigger parts of my life today than I thought that, than they were earlier on. Um, 12 and carrying a message to, to what we, you know, <laughs> fellow alcoholics. And that's like the lifeblood of this. And I'll tell you this, that I went through a period of time there where I really wasn't doing much of that. I had a sponsee pass away. And so I knew I did that, right? And I was a bad sponsor. And so, you know, he passed away as a result of that. And I stopped sponsoring guys. And I stopped participating on a level that, is, that got me sober. And I can tell you, I got distant. Now, there are people in my life today who don't allow that to happen. And there were people in my life right then, i.e. Nelson, Frick, a few others, that don't allow that to happen. And, uh, you know, it's, that's why they talk about it in these rooms. It's, it's important to get in the middle of the bed with this stuff uh, because there were significant parts of my sobriety. I didn't walk in here, stop drinking, and life was perfect. I walked in here, stop drinking, and life was good and bad and good and bad and good and bad and good and bad. And... Um, you know, over the last couple of years, of you know, some things have worked out that I had absolutely no thought that they would work out. Uh, I was chasing after a job as a major league baseball umpire. I had been training for that for years, training. I'd been working as a high school umpire. And so I then went down to Florida to go uh, pursue that, that dream that I had. And I went down there with dead set on. I told everybody about it. I told my Friend, my family, my friends, everything. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to go umpire Major League Baseball. I'm going to go umpire Minor League Baseball first because you got to do that. But I knew the MLB would be waiting for me with open arms whenever I got down there. And I didn't get the job. And I remember driving out of there, uh, and I was like four years sober, thinking, what the heck did we just do all this for? You know, that feeling was empty again. And I was driving north on 75, and this guy from uh, a collection agency called me who I'd been avoiding for the last, like, two months. And I only owed, like, 250 bucks out of over $6,000 at that point. I'd already paid off. I only owed 250 bucks more. And the guy calls me up, and I finally, I'm like, whatever, just screwed. And I answered the phone, and he said, I've put a warrant out for your arrest. And I'm driving north, and I'm just like, my life's over. Like, this is, we're bad again. It's not good. And I came back, and I had said some things to some of my fellowship up here and pushed them away a little bit. And I came back into a setting that I didn't think I, I had nobody else around me again. Uh, and again, uh, this guy, Brian, and this guy, Will, actually took me in immediately. And I was, at the, I was at the end of the tracks again. Those feelings that I was escaping when I walked in alcohol to come back up because I stopped doing the basics of what I did to get sober, wasn't participating in anybody's recovery. And I stopped doing the basics of what we do to continue sobriety, which is, you know, praying, meditating, all that stuff. I stopped doing all that stuff. I was on the edge again. And once again, a fellowship came through through for me when I didn't expect it to in terms of not the same fellowship I went down there expecting. When I came back, these guys were there because these guys gave a crap. They honestly did. When I got back up here, I I remember a cigar. I said, uh, said, I I don't know what it is that my next few years look like, but this is not. I just need some freaking help, man. If I need to go help somebody, if I need to go be of service to some other alcoholics, do it. If I need to go back to step one and redo this whole thing, let's do it. I really don't care anymore. And I remember having a conversation with my sponsor about that at the time. Uh, and then this guy, AJ, shows back up in my life who I've been roommates with at Hope Homes. And he's trying to get sober again. And, you know, he's just gone through a seizure. Like, literally the next day, he calls me up. And it's like, hey, man, I've got 70 days sober. I just didn't want to tell anybody yet. I wanted to see if it was going to stick a little bit. And that guy calls me up. And I remember walking out of there. And it's God again, man. God, God puts people in my life. And hopefully I'm in theirs for a reason, right? This whole program and these spiritual things that occurred that honestly, if I had tried to find that guy, I couldn't have found him. But yet that guy was presented to me in a moment that I needed that. And then there's, you know, some other guys that have been a part of my life today that a uh, big part of my life. That, uh, when I came back, I didn't anticipate any of that stuff happening. They were trying to get sober and they've tried to get sober and they're still trying to get sober. And it's cool seeing people change their lives around. There is fuel for my life today that doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from a drink. But it comes through this whole program of recovery that we're gifted with. I can't stay sober. It doesn't work that way. But we seem to be able to together. 
And there are times that it's great, freaking awesome. Times it's not so hot, but we are in this together. This is a heck of a lot better than I thought it was going to be when I walked through those doors. And, you know, I don't know what the rest of my life is going to look like or anything like that. None of us do. I feel like everybody else has like a whole life plan figured out, and I'm like the one guy who doesn't. And I, I have a lot of goals. I talk about them a lot. But I really don't know. God's working all this stuff out. It works out in the end. God has not gotten any of us here tonight to just drop us off tomorrow. <laughs> right? It works out for a reason. Uh, and so, anyways, you know, there's I'm at, back in school now at University of Georgia. Went back to school up there. I'm getting my degree in atmospheric sciences. And, uh, yeah, another cool guy. And so, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what, but I don't know what's going to, I have some hopes. I have some dreams. I have some things I want to do with that degree. But honestly, whatever it looks like, we're okay with it. Whatever, whatever happens, that we're okay with it. I honestly am. And I can honestly say that without saying that, without like on the inside saying like freaking out, right? Like on the, uh, that's, that's the real story. I don't, whatever we say, we're good. We're good. I'm not that type of guy. Uh, but this program enables me to be that type of guy and enables all of us to do that if we're in the middle of the boat. Uh, so anyways, I think we're about, yeah, we're good enough. So uh, it's an honor and privilege to be able to participate in the meeting. If you didn't relate, there'll be another speaker next Friday night. Yeah, it's Friday night, right? Yeah, Friday night. And uh, hopefully come back. and Maybe you'll hear something you relate to, but I appreciate your time, and thank you for letting me participate tonight. So. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.